Hi, I'm Tony Russo, and this is Funeral Service Insider from Kate's Boylston. Each episode features conversations about emerging trends and news that affect the death care industry. We talk to people who understand the delicate balance of change in a profession and vocation steep in tradition. In this episode, I'm speaking with Jennifer Floyd, and she is the funeral director in charge of the San Antonio College Mortuary, which is just like it sounds. Um, Last year, they started to put together this idea that the college itself could have its own mortuary and that would be the perfect way to get the students up and running and make sure that they were fit. You recall in our last episode, people were talking about students not having enough practice and the expectations are so different in a funeral home than they are for mortuary school. And we're going to cover the gap um, or the supposed gap between those two kind of at length in 2025. I'm working on a larger feature about that. It's a tough proposition, but a worthwhile one. And yeah, I'm going to let Jennifer tell you about it because she is the expert and she is a wonderful guest. So before I get on to Jennifer, I do want to encourage you to stay on afterwards for the postmortem because I will be talking about the music that you should be listening to. And as always, please make sure you reach out to us if you have any questions, problems, or concerns. You can do that in the show notes. And also, if you are not subscribed, please subscribe. We're going to be doing some fun stuff in the next six or eight weeks, and uh, I'd hate for you to miss any of it. All right, that is enough of me. Here is Jennifer Floyd. So you're coming up on your first year, I guess, your, your first anniversary of being at San Antonio. Can you tell me how you came to the job and if you knew that opening this mortuary uh, this year, this funeral home, I guess, this year was on the agenda when when you took the job back in 2023? I was actually corporate America. I've been um, with various corporations in the funeral industry um, and some private-owned funeral homes. But in 2023, I was looking to progress in my career, and the institution was looking for a director of operations for the mortuary. And so a gentleman uh contacted me via LinkedIn and said, I thought, I think we have a position that you would be a perfect fit for. Would you like to apply? And I applied and the rest is kind of history. (laughs) So I relocated here. um, And where had you been? I'm from Alabama. So I'm, I am Ah. not a native Texan. (laughs) (laughs) So I am actually originally from Alabama, but I've been licensed in South Carolina, Missouri, Alabama, and now Texas. And that's interesting. Can you tell me where you, was the moving around to advance your career or was it for new challenges or was it like family driven or? No, my uh, my moves were all based on advancing my career. One thing about the funeral industry is that you pretty much have to be willing to go in order to grow. And that is what I tell the students. You know, so often we get complacent and we want to stay close to family. And that's all fine and well. But I've only found that that works for those who are a part of a family owned mortuary. Mm. Um, So meaning that if your grandfather owned it and now your dad owned it and you're in line to own it next, that's phenomenal. But for those who are like me that are first generation funeral directors and embalmers, um, you're going to have to be willing to go, especially if you want to advance. You know, coming from rural areas, the pay is not what people think it is. And so if you want to have that financial stability as well as grow professionally and see how things are done in various cultures to expose yourself to new ideas, new opportunities, new trends, even the latest and greatest software, you have to be willing to move out of your comfort zone. So that's what it's been for me. I've never been afraid to pick up and go in this industry. Um, I, I told my children 20 years ago when I came in this industry that we were going to be more like a military family. Yeah. 
we're going to be on a different assignment every few years, you know, because I, I understood that. Well, and, and so let me let me kind of compliment you and then ask you if my compliment is accurate. <laughs> One of the things that we've been talking, we just put out a compensation survey and among the top topics is retention. One of the things that some of the, I guess, higher end or or maybe better funeral home owners understand is it's going to be really hard to keep that third person. Like you're going to have people who are working under you, but you're going to have a person who is built to eventually be an owner or a manager, and they're going to be the third in line. <laughs> and, they're, and they're not going to be able to stay around for very long because being the third in line means that they're never going to get that opportunity unless they move. Does that sound? Yes, I, I will say that that is totally accurate. So when I initially started my career um, in 2000, I worked for a family-owned funeral home. It was great experience. It was great exposure. And then I left and I went to college. And in college, I worked with another family-owned funeral home. And after graduation, I went to another family-owned funeral home. Being in those family-owned funeral homes, what I truly loved about them was they set the foundation for me. In family-owned funeral homes, we may not have all the latest and greatest technologies, but they taught me how to be resourceful with what I had. So that was a foundational principle that I am grateful for because now I can go anywhere and work even with the most minimum basic. I'm able to make things happen even as an embalmer. Um, I may not have all the latest and greatest tools available to me, but because I started in family owned, I learned how to do things. I learned how to make something out of nothing. So for me, that was that was great. And that's what I, I tell the students. Listen, it's you know, at that moment in my career, I was more concerned with getting experience, setting that foundation more than I was the compensation because I learned early on that compensation was going to be the last piece of the puzzle. You're never going to walk into this industry making what people think you make or even what you feel like you're worth because sometimes right. the funding is just not there and that's okay. And that's why I tell the students, I don't do this for the money. I, I do this for the love. It's a calling for me because money doesn't make me want to leave my family on their birthdays or Christmases or Thanksgivings and not be able to attend baseball games and family functions. So compensation never played a role in my career for me. I have been blessed to now build upon that foundation where I make you know, a great salary. Um, but initially coming in, that that is not what it's about. It's about doing something that you love, that you're passionate about, helping people and learning as much as you can learn to build on. And I'm sorry, I let it get past because I didn't want to interrupt you, but where did you go to Mortuary College? I went to Washington College in Willing, Illinois. And looking back now, are there things you do or don't do based on what the education was like then versus how it is now? Absolutely. Um, one thing I will say is that attending Horsham College, I was taught things that I never knew I would need. I, I didn't realize the importance of going to dinner and eating with the correct fork or the correct spoon. So we had we took an etiquette class at Worsham College. Huh. And our professor, Dee Dee Franks, taught us how to interview at a restaurant. Um, she taught us how to respectfully decline a drink, how that's just a test to see if you will accept the drink. And as I started to interview, especially with corporate corporations and corporate executives, I saw it more and more. I saw what she was talking about. I saw when they would pick me up from the airport and take me to a restaurant and they said, well, you can order a cocktail. And immediately in my mind, I went back to what Didi told me. You don't ever order a cocktail when you're on a job interview. So I appreciate that aspect of it because I didn't know that. I was new. I came into the funeral industry. I don't want to say I was relatively young, but I was a little young. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I didn't know that. But because she taught me that, um, that is something that I carry with me to this day. And that is also something that I tell my students. You know, their employers, when, when they're interviewing you, they want to know that you are a good fit. And there are certain things that they're going to do. They're going to put you in certain situations to see how you respond. And one is they're going to take you to a fancy restaurant. They want to see how you conduct yourself. They want to see, are you going to order? Be make sure to let us know just because they are drinking does not mean you should drink. You don't have the job yet. That's the first time I've heard that story. That's a, that's a fantastic uh, insight that, that you're able to bring along. So during your career, I guess you're always kind of moving 
did you did you see yourself as eventually becoming an educator or is that something that's really just kind of come over you more recently? No, I, I've never seen myself become an educator. However, every funeral director and embalmer is an educator from the standpoint that we take on apprentices or interns and right. we teach them what we know, whether it's in the embalming lab or whether it's at the front of the house when they're assisting us on funerals. So I've never thought about venturing into the higher ed world. However, I've always been an educator because that that's our job. We are always to impart what we know onto those that are coming up because someone has to continue to do it after we're long gone. And if we don't share our knowledge with them, especially our real world knowledge beyond the textbooks, who's going to carry on? When you went for this interview, what were some of the what were some of your concerns about going into education? Because you're not you didn't just go into education; you went into administration and education, which is a big school or, or a well-known school, I guess, in funeral service, if nothing else. Yes. You know, I I really just kind of walked in with my eyes wide open and my ears um, wide open, ready to receive everything. One thing I've learned is that everything is different everywhere you go. So and that's the other thing that I teach the students. No matter where you go in this funeral industry, everybody is going to do things different. You take a little bit from this person or that person or this place or that place, and then you put it together with what you already know and you build upon it. And so for me, that has been what I've done. Um, Yes, I came in, I came in on the administration side of it, but I also have been a manager for many, many years at corporate owned funeral homes. So I just utilized all of the knowledge that I had being a manager in the corporate world, and I incorporated that here. The biggest difference or the challenge that I found since being here is that we're merging higher ed with funeral service and, and being a customer facing funeral home. And so there's there's some little hurdles that we have to overcome because we've merged two totally, completely different worlds. So higher ed tells us we can do things within this parameter. And then we have the funeral service, Texas Funeral Commission and the Federal Trade Commission that says you do things this way. So we have to find that silver lining in that to be able to make sure that we are taking everything into account and doing everything we need to do to accomplish our goals on both sides. And also the accreditation. Absolutely. The accreditation. <laughs> um, yes. And can you tell me about like meeting the staff and, and how, how you how you got yourself you know, on board with the staff and how you ended up relating to them. Was it easy? Was it was it difficult? You know, how were the personalities? You know, I, I think that the personalities are they were welcoming. Um everybody is is different. Everybody right. has their own way of doing things. Um so you just what I always do is remind myself that no two people do it the same. No pe- no two people think the same way. So it's about finding a common ground. You know, I I often tell people, my colleagues here have been at this institution for 20 plus years. So they have a lot of higher ed knowledge that I don't have. And I have been in the corporate funeral world for 20 plus years. So together, although they are licensed funeral directors and embalmers, they have primarily focused on the higher education aspect of it for the last 20 plus years, where I have been in the corporate business sector of it for the, that same amount of time. So we we both bring something to the table. Um, so we it's just about putting your minds together and figuring out what's going to be best for the institution and the students, as well as the program. And, and how did you approach the idea of making this a public... Uh, funeral home, like, because you had, I guess, what six months to get it to get it up and ready to go. You started in February. Well, I, I yeah, I started in August, and so when I came aboard, um, the plan was already in place to make it a customer facing funeral mm-hmm. home. Um, I think like most funeral homes in today's society, post COVID, they just had to hire someone. And so when they brought me on board, there was, of course, some things that we had to make sure we had in place. We had to get us a hearse and do a, a, you know, a couple of little tweaks here and there, do a couple of little remodeling to the building. However, you know, we were all hands on deck. Everybody was excited. And so we just collaboratively worked together to make sure we put our best foot forward. And I'm I'm sorry, have you had any families yet? I don't know. No, we have not had any families yet. I'm I'm so sorry, but I only know one other thing is is like going to the the haircutting school and kind of holding your breath. 
Um, do you, do you think that people are, are nervous or do you think they just haven't heard yet or is the program still too new? I think that it's probably a combination of all of it. So in the funeral industry, most families like to go where they have always gone. Mm. They're traditional. If grandmother went to this funeral home, then mom is going to go to this funeral home. Then I'm going to go to this funeral home. So we have to overcome that hurdle. Um, I think that explaining to them that although we are an educational institution, all of our instructors are licensed funeral directors and embalmers with probably combined 50 or more years of funeral service experience. So once the public learns that, yes, we are an educational institution that has became a customer-facing funeral home, we are still a funeral home. We can still offer you the same services that your local funeral home can offer you. Um, and you're still going to get a quality service by licensed professionals. Yes, our students will assist us with embalmings. However, our students assist us with embalmings for other funeral homes because we do embalm for local funeral homes here in San Antonio. That is how our students get their embalming lab experience. So once people understand that, I think we'll be fine. But I think that also being new, no one really wants to be the first right family right? <laughs> you know it's kind of like when that new restaurant opened up in town <laughs> nobody's going to be the first person to go there to try that food you want to wait for someone else go and spend their money and see uh, what they say about that that uh, restaurant <laughs> right so i think it's kind of the same concept we want to give someone else that opportunity to use that funeral home see what they're going to say about it um before we go we step out and, and give them a try and Will the students be in the arrangement conference and like, will you handle the arrangement? How is, how do you see that working? Yes. Uh, Our students will sit in the arrangement conferences. They will uh, assist us with the arrangement conferences. They will even speak with the families. That is part of their educational um, experience. We want to give them real world experiences. We want to make sure that when they graduate from college, the first time they sit in an arrangement conference at their job is not the first time they've ever sat in an arrangement conference. Mm. So we want, we want them to sit. Uh, the first time they'll sit and observe. The next time or they will jump in and, and, and take all of the vital statistics and all the information needed for the death certificate and assist the families with writing funeral programs, obituaries, death notices, and assist with gathering the information for the death certificate so, yes, our students will be from A to Z with the mortuary. They will do it all. And one of the things that I think uh, you have an interesting advantage is, is there's no way to like to ruin the business. This is still just about not just about education, but since it's about education, the families are going to, I think, I guess, have some sort of understanding about that. Yes. So the very unique thing about Texas is that. On our embalming authorizations, it tells the families that embalming may take place uh, with the assistance of a mortuary science student. So families know from the word go that, hey, there may very well be a student that's assisting. Um, Again, our students are no different from apprentices or interns. Uh, They're just in the beginning stages, whereas an apprentice you may have already graduated school. As an intern, you may have already completed your educational portion of it. But one thing that I like to tell families is that the funeral industry is one of those ever-evolving industries. We're going to learn something new every day. Mm. And that is what has kept me in this industry, is that no two days are the same. No two families are the same. No two services are the same. So even myself being in this industry for 24 years, every day I learn something new. Every family that I meet is you know, a different family. And I'm going to learn something, whether it's their customs or their religious beliefs or how they want their loved one dressed, whatever it is, every day is an opportunity to learn something in our business. Whether you are fully licensed with 20 years of experience or you are a new graduate apprentice or intern or whether you are an active student. And now does the, since you have this part of the puzzle that that no one else has. Do you have a, an aftercare program that you're working with? Do you do any pre-need sales with the students? So aftercare is a program that I'm currently building on. Um, for me personally, um, I am working to see what families would like. And I think that the key component of that is learning the families because 
with aftercare, some families don't want you to contact them. So we walk a fine line with aftercare. Um, so I'm just trying to learn the culture of San Antonio and what the families like and uh-huh. don't like, because that'll help me better um, help them. And I, t- I tell the students all the time, being that I've been licensed in so many states in St. Louis, Missouri, we don't view going into the chapel. We do what's called a parting view. So after the funeral service has concluded, we take the family around to see their loved one for the last time before we close the casket. Well, in Alabama, we don't do that. We When we process the family in, the family goes in and see that casket. Uh, it's open. They see their loved one. Then we seat them. The funeral service starts. We close the casket. And at the conclusion, we go to the cemetery. So as you can see, depending on where you are in the world, the customs are different. Mm. So it's it's all about learning the culture of where you are so you can make sure that you cater your aftercare program to what families are actually going to find beneficial. Because if I don't see a benefit in something, I don't want to participate in it. Right. And but I guess the effort, though, at least shows the students that there is there is a there is a benefit in that for someone. Oh, absolutely. I, I tell the students all the time that I feel that it's our job, it's our, our duty to show families that we don't just care for them during the pre knee aspect of it or during, which is the at knee aspect of it. We care for them all the way through because think about it. Families don't know what they don't know. I don't know that I need to finalize or look for additional insurance policy. I don't know that I need to contact Social Security Administration. I don't know that I need to provide a death certificate to every credit card company that mom had or close out all of her credit files. So families don't know that because that is the farthest thing from their minds. But we as professionals, we know that services don't just stop when we take a family and leave their loved one at the cemetery. So we need to be there to guide them along the way because there are so many other things that need to take place after that funeral. So that's what aftercare is in my mind. It's about making sure our families know that now is when the hard work starts. The hard work of uh, transferring titles of vehicles or uh, transferring deeds to property or, you know, closing out mom's bank accounts or making sure that you've notified Medicare or Medicaid. So that is what aftercare is, just ensuring that the families know what they need to do to progress. Terry School, founder of the Davis Whitehall Company, will present It's Time to Get Personal with Cremation Families at the November 12th and 13th Advances in Funeral Innovations Conference in Houston, Texas. We spoke with Terry about his presentation. Customized goes all the way from making a certain size arm, to fit in a special niche, or to the time that we had five family members killed in a tragic car accident together. We made an urn to house five people. They were huge Green Bay Packer fans. We designed this urn that had their name arched across the front. Then underneath it was his first name, date of birth, the wife's name, first name, date of birth, and then each child's first name, date of birth. Then under that, entered into eternal life together on this day. The Green Bay Packers gave a one-time release to do some things to the urn. This urn was carried down the aisle in church like a casket. The funeral director said, Terry, I have never seen so many people line up at the cemetery to take a picture of this urn. 30 days go by and I get a nondescript envelope in the mail and I open it up. I'm looking at this picture and go, what the heck? There's five people standing here, all with Green Bay Packer jerseys on. And she says that I go, (gasps) letters from both sides of the family saying you have no idea what this means to me what it meant to that family. This is what customization can do for you. For more information and to register, click the link below or visit events.kates-boylston.com. We're speaking now. It is uh, the end of June. Are you guys staffed in the summer? How is that going to work? Yes. So because we are a customer facing care in the home, we are staffed. So I, so I am a 12 month employee. <laughs> no, I mean, will you have students available to you if someone comes in, let's say in the middle of July and wants a funeral? Yes. Uh, so right now, currently uh, there's a class in the mortuary now that is uh, participating in funeral services, missiles. So yes, since we do have summer classes, ah. we do have some students available. Oh, that's and you, you mentioned earlier that sometimes you're able to get cadavers. Do you do that? Um, so do you, do you run mock funerals now with the cadavers? No. So the cadavers are for the students in the anatomy lab. So you have to give them back. Um, so, yes. <laughs> so we do mock funerals 
and it's more or less like a role play. We'll we have caskets in our funeral homes. So, for instance, right now the students is, is in a class and they are doing mock dismissals, and that's where uh, Mary Mena, who's our program coordinator and also one of our professors, she teaches the class how to dismiss families from funeral services, and she walked through various scenarios with them, whether they are dismissing from a grave site, whether they are dismissing from a church or the chapel or they're dismissing from a memorial service. So she teaches the students how to conclude a service and properly dismiss a family. So they're doing that. When students come over with me to shadow me because I don't have a case right now, I sit down with the students. I teach them how to take first calls. I teach them how to document uh, vital statistic information for a death certificate. I walk them through making a funeral arrangement. I, I take them upstairs to our casket selection room and explain to them the differences in the caskets, the urns, the vaults, the memorial packages. And I show them how to properly present these items to families without seeming like a used car salesperson. Right. Because that that's that's something that, that takes years to get good at anyway. You may as well start start as early as possible. Right. Do you have uh, vendors, particular vendors that you work with? Like, especially, you know, once you're up and running, you may need caskets on like shorter notice or, you know, you, you need a family management, uh, a case management system and things like that. Are all those in place and are the students able to like working with vendors and things like that. Is that is that on the agenda or is that is that too high level? No, no. So yes, we do have casket vendors. We do have casket vendors and vault vendors. Uh, we have a company that we use for our memorial book packages. And yes, we will utilize contract software. So we have all those things in place right now. And what we do show our students is how to go into the system to order a casket how to go into the system and create a funeral service contract. So students are learning how to do that. We actually have an educational side of the software, and then we have the business side right. of the software. And although they are the exact same, we try to make sure that our students don't see the customer's information. So if they're, if the student is, say, in a class, 10 students to, to the class, they have an actual side of the software where they will log in and be able to mimic everything that I do on the business side. But for the students that are actually shadowing me or interning here with me, then they will get to see the actual business side of it. And again, both sides are the exact same, but we have a duty to protect our clients. Mm. So we're not just going to make the business side open to everybody that's in our program. Right. And when you start taking families, is it going to be something that like a student can sign up for? Is everybody going to get a chance? Like if you're going to, let's say, have one family, you know, this summer, you know, and oh, and you have 10 students, all 10 aren't going to go, right? It's just going to be kind of a first come first serve. How do you, how do you imagine that'll work? So that will, the program coordinator and I will get together. And if a student has an internship and they need to be at a funeral home that day, then that student or a couple of those students will come and assist me. Um, If all the students have completed their funeral home internship portion, then it's, then she and I will get together and say, okay, what student would you like to send over to me? We want to make sure that all of our students have the opportunity but of course, you and I both know we can't bring 10 students over to this one family, right? So, of course, it would be on a rotation system. And so um, we, we, we said 10 students. About how many students do you have in the program? How many apply? How many do you accept? Now, that is more of a Mary Manor question. I think, All right. <laughs> yeah, that's more of the program coordinator. Um, if, you, if you can hold on one second, I can have her step in. Is that Okay. I guess, what are your hopes for the future of this program? How do you see it running in three years, five years, 10 years? Well, as the educational program, the mortuary science program, I would like to see it continue to incline with student enrollment. I think that post-COVID, a lot of funeral directors and bombers have retired or went on to other careers. So I think that I would definitely like to see it grow so that we can produce more qualified funeral directors and embalmers to assist our industry. I think that that's where I would like to see the educational side of it go. As far as the funeral home itself, the business aspect of the funeral home, I would like to see it grow uh, as well. I would like to see families, uh, to. I would like for us to cement ourselves in the communities. Uh, 
care for families, mm-hmm. letting them know that we're here for the here for them, not just to bear their loved ones, but just as a community partner to offer educational um components to them because families don't know what they don't know. But if we can get to families and teach them what to expect um, as far as the business aspect of it, I think that it would help them with their grief process. Um, One thing I will say is that um, I know like uh, for my family, um, not knowing where insurance policies are, um, not knowing if your loved one have insurance, not knowing what documents you need to take to the funeral home. Those are things that I want to educate the family on. I, I've have unfortunately had to bury loved ones where I didn't know where anything was. So now I teach my children, okay, this is where you get, this is the casket I want. This is how you order it. This is the cemetery I want to go to. This is where the deed to my cemetery property is. This is the vault that I've picked out. This is who you call. This is the funeral home I want to use. Um, you know, I have a minor daughter, so I had to tell my my adult sons that if I should pass away while my daughter is still a minor, okay, this is this is how she accesses her funds. This is who gets her. Um, this is how I want her money distributed to her. This is the things I want you all to do for her. Here's a list of my bank account numbers. Here's all of my insurance policies. Um, I've already put you on the bank account to transfer upon death. So these are conversations that I have with my sons. Um, and so these are conversations that I try to tell families that although no one wants to talk about death, you need to have these conversations. Because if you don't have these conversations, we get families that get before us and they completely draw a blank. They don't know anything. Mm. Well, what was your mother's mother's maiden name? Because that is what's required for the death certificate. Oh, I don't know. Um, everybody that would know that has passed on. So it's things like that that we <laughs> that families need to know that they're going to need to know when someone passes away that we need to educate them on. And um, I imagine again to to return to the other other things that colleges do. This will be less expensive. So we are not the least expensive. We're not the most expensive. We fall in the middle. And my understanding is the thought process was we didn't want to come off as competitive. Because we are not in competition with anyone. Our all of our local funeral homes right. are our community partners. We are here to assist them if they should ever need us. We are here. And as part of that, you do you have a crematory on site? Do you offer cremation? We offer cremations, but we partner with a third party crematory. And that is again part of our community partnership. We partner with the local crematory here to handle all of our cremations for us. And I guess that's something that it's good for the students to know as well, that they can, that that's, that that's a way, not only a way to run business, but it's a way like many uh, funeral Absolutely. Homes students um, are, are told that, listen, very few funeral homes own their own crematory. And that is not a bad thing. Uh, you just have to make sure that you inform the families that you don't have an on-site crematory. And so I, I teach the students about being transparent. And that's a, that's a great opportunity to, to do that. And I guess in this in this kind of topsy turvy GPL world, how do you how do you handle that? Like, can you get called by the by by the FTC? Is that something you have to have uh, the students prepared? So to yes, do? so uh, in our mortuary management two class, our students are taught about the Federal Trade Commission. They are taught the rules and regulations on what we can and cannot do according to the Federal Trade Commission. And pricing is one of those things that we focus on it to a great deal because we want students to know you have to be honest. You have to be transparent. You may not be the least expensive funeral home and that's okay. Families will choose you if they want to utilize you, but you can never decline a general price list to a family. You have to make that readily available because that is the worst thing anyone could do is not be transparent with their pricings. You not only have to worry about the Federal Trade Commission and the Funeral Service Commission, you have to worry about your own personal and professional reputation. Oh, and along those, uh, two two quick follow up questions on that. One is, do you do you have a a website for the business? Yes, our website is San Antonio College Mortuary dot com or SAC S A C Mortuary dot com. Uh-huh. And um, have you have you had any any inquiries yet? Is that is that something? Are people calling to just kind of see what's yes, going on? Yes, we've there? had inquiries. Uh, we've invited families to come out for open house. So yes, we we want to be an open book for our community. We want them to know that that we're here to serve them. 
we understand that this is something new, being that we sit on a college campus. But once again, everybody here that works within the Mortuary Science Program and the San Antonio College Mortuary are licensed funeral directors and embalmers with many years of experience. And we're still going to offer your families that top level customer service that you expect from any uh, local funeral home. We just happen to be educational, yeah. meaning that we just happen to have our students that work hands on. But that is a great learning opportunity for our students so they know how to take care of you. Very cool. Well, then, thank you so much for your time. You're absolutely welcome. Funeral Service Insider, the podcast, is a Kate Spoilston production. It was written and edited by me, Tony Russo. I say it every week. I said it at the beginning of the show. I'll say it if you stop me in the street. If you're listening, please check out the show notes and you can find all the links to all the things we discussed. Plus, you can get in touch with us and tell us what you think about the show and make suggestions for going forward. I always love to get as much feedback as possible. We always also ask that you subscribe to the show or follow if you're on Apple. And why should this week be any different? What's cool about subscribing is sometimes you can lose track of what shows you are listening to. If you're subscribed, it'll come up and then you can listen to it at your leisure. It'll always be on your phone until you don't want it there anymore. So something to consider. And actually that ties very much into this week's postmortem, which is about our Spotify channel, which is run by, well, we're going to say some of the folks over at American Cemetery and Cremation. At the end of each issue of the magazine, there is a a song list that was chosen for its cemetery value. And it's become quite a nice little list, and it's worth listening to. If you are in funeral service at all, if you're interested in all in funeral service, you definitely should check out this list. I don't know where he finds these songs. I don't know where they find these songs. I'm not sure who finds them, but they put them in the back page of American Cemetery and Cremation. Even if you're not a subscriber to those, you can listen to the Spotify playlist. And because I get some of the statistics, I know that there are many of you that already are listening on Spotify. So if you're listening to this episode on Spotify, just click over and search for Sem Jams. That is C E M J A M Z. Of course, if you're not listening on Spotify, that doesn't matter. You can just click the link in the show notes and it will bring you over to the playlist and you can check it out. Check out some of the songs. It's it's really a well curated list. It's something that I think we're proud of, but I don't know if enough people know about. So please check that out. And that will do it for this week on Funeral Service Insider the podcast.